Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry. This week, we're going to be chatting about diabetes type 1 and type 2. Over the course of the last few years, it's something that has come up time and time again. So we decided to dedicate a full episode to it, so that you know everything that you need to know, from symptoms to management and how to avoid it all together. I'm delighted to be joined by GP and TV expert Dr. Sumi Dunn to talk us through exactly what diabetes is and what we can do about it. Sumi, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm really well, thanks, Carl. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to see you. Good to catch up. Listen, diabetes is huge. It's it's a national uh, issue that we need to chat about more and more. So let's chat about it. How do you define diabetes? Let's start there. Yeah, no, uh, how do we define diabetes? I think what needs to be said, first of all, there are distinct type of diabetes. You've got type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and then you've another category that's emerging nowadays where we call it other diabetes, where it's not quite type 1 and it's not quite type 2. And certainly in type 1 diabetes, I think everybody and type 2 diabetes, everyone associates it with having an increased level of sugar or glucose in your blood. And that's quite a simplistic view, but it's not entirely incorrect. Uh, But how the diagnosis of this is made and how it affects you is really, really different. So if we just take type 1 diabetes uh, in its entity, very much so there are risk factors and they're quite different to type 2 diabetes. Possibly already having a parent or a sibling with type 1 diabetes leads you to more risk of having it. So there is what we know, a genetic stroke family history, combined possibly with environmental factors and plus or minus a common infection, which might trigger the onset. So sometimes we might see an onset being triggered by a child having a viral illness. And I use the word child because in type 1 diabetes, most of the diagnosis is made in childhood, unlike type 2 diabetes. We also know that type 1 diabetes is what we call an autoimmune condition, where the cells of the body are reacting against each other to cause a destruction of the cells in the pancreas, which is the organ that produces insulin, and insulin is our regulator of blood sugar. So if you already have one autoimmune condition, the chances of you developing type 1 diabetes is higher. So those are the kind of risk factors around type 1 diabetes. If we look at type 2 diabetes, We can see the greater age that people are diagnosed in are the older years, over 40 years of age. Uh, If you've had diabetes through pregnancy, so what we call gestational diabetes, we also know that you're at higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on. If your weight and your height are not in proportion, that too can also make you more at risk of type 2 diabetes, particularly as, you know, you and I have spoken about this before in the past, Carl, if we're carrying more weight around our waist, you know, yeah, that's so central, that central obesity that puts you at a higher yeah, risk. Yeah. yeah, that apple shape, that, that kind of aspect. Combine that with a more sedentary lifestyle. So, you know, you're not able for whatever reasons or it just hasn't happened that you're taking 30 minutes of good physical activity every day. And then add in other risk factors that can sometimes come with age, but can also come with lifestyle, having a high blood pressure or or either high cholesterol. And as you can see, having a high blood pressure or high cholesterol is fairly unlikely in children. So there's kind of the distinction between type 1 and type 2. And then this other group that we now know about, interestingly, has a picture of both. Uh, Quite rare and probably not in the realm of discussion for today. Uh, So that's really where we look at diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Okay, and today we're we're going to focus pretty much on on, on type 2 mainly, aren't we? Because if you have type 1, it's important that you see your GP, you talk to your consultant, and that, you know, it's more managed in that hospital kind of medical setting than than maybe type 2 might be. Uh, Absolutely. I think, you know, what's really important that if there is a suspicion that a child or a young adolescent or even a young, you know, let's say someone in their 20s is developing type 1 diabetes, it's important that they come into us in general practice quickly, that the diagnosis is made quickly, that we tie in with our specialist care centres and that, you know, the ongoing management is what we call a shared care aspect between hospitals and also general practice because it's ongoing. It will be lifelong. And with type 1 diabetes, for the moment, there is no cure. So management is incredibly important. Type 2 diabetes can be quite successfully managed 
in general practice and we know that and those that have engaged in general practice with diabetes type 2 management care are now recently availing certainly with a medical card of what we call a chronic disease management as in again a management of symptoms that are lifelong but now has a dedicated care pathway in general practice. And with type 2, those lifestyle factors and changing those lifestyle factors are absolutely crucial in terms of the management of it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we there are several stages before the actual type 2 diabetes act comes to fruition. So it's not a case that you'll get a warning sign. It's not a case that you'll wake up one morning and go, oh, this might be happening to me. There can be some subtle symptoms that lead into it. You might feel that you're more thirsty, you're frequently urinating, you might find yourself more prone to having urine infections. It may be picked up that you know, you've gone into the GP, had your blood pressure checked, and out of the blue, all of a sudden it's high. You know, combined with that, you might note that all of a sudden, out of the blue, your cholesterol is high. You know, and those would be kind of what I would call symptoms to get investigated a little bit more if we go back and say, hold on a minute, I'm not in a position to be able to get good physical activity. You know, I'm carrying all of a sudden more weight around my waist uh, and possibly, you know, one or two other things are coming into play. You might notice you're tired. You might notice there's some tingling in your hands and feet or, you know, fingertips might feel numb or a few little things might not add up. Certainly in women, uh, they might notice frequent um, attacks of vaginal candida. That can sometimes be a giveaway clue because you're urinating out quite a lot of sugar and sugar then will be the trigger for having a yeast infection, that yeast infection being vaginal candida. Uh, similarly, in men, there might be a penile balanitis, an irritation around the foreskin, which can be itchy, plus or minus a discharge. So there are some little giveaways that might trigger people to go through and come to us in general practice, but it's no harm if there is one aspect, as in a high blood pressure or a high cholesterol level, just getting everything else to include your glucose levels, what we call the definitive test, a glycosylated hemoglobin known as an HbA1c, that really is our diagnostic criteria. Okay, so if someone goes into you as a GP, you with, with some of those symptoms, they will get a bloods analysis done and that's what you're gonna that's what you're gonna have a look at. I, I'm certainly going to take on board their lifestyle. I'm going to take on board everything they're telling me. I will be, you know, in the immediacy, I will be dipping their urine. I will be taking their blood pressure and I'll be doing what we call, you know, opportunistic bloods. So you actually don't need to come into us fasting. That, you know, is a bit of a myth nowadays. We can make a diagnosis without fasting bloods. It's great if you are. But if you're not, you know, we can mitigate for that. And I'm dipping your urine to see that on that given day, is there any sugar in your urine? But that too may not be diagnostic because if you've had a sugary drink just before you've come in or you've eaten something that gives you a fast spike in sugar, be it a chocolate bar or even, you know, some of the breakfast cereals that are high in sugar, you'll get a transient spike in sugar. So combined with dipping your urine, I do want to do your bloods. And I'm going to be looking at your sugar levels in bloods, and I'm going to be looking for a certain level at that. And if my risk factor, because of what you're telling me, if I'm getting more and more of an indication there could be a type 2 diabetes picture, I certainly will do your glycosylated hemoglobin and have a look at that. Um, okay, so and then if you have type 2 diabetes, what is the treatment? First of all, it's again, are we pre-diabetic or have we actually moved into the diabetes category? If we're pre-diabetic, the management is lifestyle. So your sugar levels are elevated. Your glycosylated hemoglobin is high, but it's not in the diabetic range. Then the treatment here is lifestyle. It's about being quite evaluative about what kind of food am I eating? And we do know there is a higher incidence of type 2 diabetes with that newer fast food type generation, convenience food, and possibly, again, appreciating that people may not have the time to sit down and cook from scratch. What we do know is protective is that if we're eating a whole food and nutrient dense diet, you know, it's the same words that we hear all the time, uh, you know, cooking from scratch, using your whole foods, eating as many whole grains as we can, uh, trying to, you know, bake with as many little trans fats as possible. All of that is really protective 
against type 2 diabetes. Uh, again, trying to get in regular exercise, even can you stop the car 15, 20 minutes away from work and use that 15, 20 minutes to walk into work or use public transport and walk, use the stairs where you can, all of that opportunistic aspects that we say to integrate within your day, because we are so aware, particularly with cost of living, how you know difficult it can be to try and integrate everything together in a way that's manageable for everyone. But pre-diabetes, the main state is lifestyle. If people are smoking, we would strongly encourage them to stop smoking as well. Smoking also adds on to a higher cholesterol risk. So it, it's all managing it around that. Lowering blood pressure, if the blood pressure is elevated, you know, marginally elevated, again, through lifestyle, looking at dietary sodium. So it's all these little add-ons that can lead to the legacy effect. If type 2 diabetes has been diagnosed, again, in the first instance, we will strongly advocate for making every contact count with your GP, but also looking at lifestyle in tandem to seeing if medication needs to be started. And if it needs to be started, then it's very much incremental. We try to use the lowest dose of medication to manage the high sugar levels, normally with a drug known as metformin, and then see does lifestyle and drugs help manage same and hopefully contain at the lowest dose of drugs. But quite often, again, people are individual things can change. I can't compare myself to you or to anyone else. So what might be appropriate for someone like myself may not be appropriate for someone like you, Carl, being a male and being taller, if that makes sense, may not be appropriate for somebody else. So again, medication management is tailor-made and it may be that quite a bit of tweaking is done until we get to the right dose of medicine. But at no given point is lifestyle going to do you any harm? And with aggressive lifestyle management, we do know people have been able to reverse type 2 diabetes. Yeah, so weight loss, fat loss, body shape changes, reducing the, 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 the body fat around the center of the body. And one thing you've, you've said time and time again is that lifestyle, lifestyle, lifestyle. You've repeated about 10 times in the last minute, which is brilliant. And one thing people may associate with diabetes, I think it's important to bring it up and just to, to chat through it, is that kind of, you know, limb amputation. And presumably that's a worst case scenario. Is it for type one or is that for type two as well? It, it, can, it can happen to both. Um, you know, what we do know is that certainly in some types, types of type two diabetes, we know that in, you know, and the evidence has shown that some people might have had up to at least a decade or more of exposure to long-term high blood glucose levels and not know about it. So that by the time they come through to us, there's already other complications, what we call organ damage. Uh, and particularly, there can be damage at a micro, so at small blood vessel level or large, a macro blood vessel level through the body. Uh, and what we desperately are you know, keen to prevent in type one and type two are these micro and macro vascular damage. And that's what can lead to the blindness that you may hear about or the retinopathy, which is disease processes at the back of the eye, heart disease, kidney disease, in turn, what we call vessel disease, which can then go on to lead to, in worst case scenario, amputation. Uh, and that also on its own carries an early mortality. That is also applicable to type 1 diabetes. So hence why, and given that we know that our type 1 diabetics are diagnosed in childhood, we're really keen to keep everybody as well as possible and be integrated into good cohesive care. So it's really that prevention of damage to large and small blood vessels that we're very, very keen to prevent. So you'll find with our type 2 diabetes management, you'll hear in general practice, you'll hear about foot care, that we're keen that our patients get good foot care with registered qualified chiropodists who have expertise in looking after cutting the nails. And interestingly, that's because in unregulated type 2 diabetes, Sometimes you can lose the feeling in your nerves called a neuropathy, particularly at the lower end. So at your fingertips and it can move up through the hands and certainly at the tips of the toes. And that can move up through the feet. And in medical terms, that's known as a glove and stocking distribution. And if that happens and if we think about it, you might get a cut or you might get a small infection 
you know, from cutting your toenails and you, you might not realise it, you don't feel it because the nerves aren't working well. And then an infection can set up and that can be quite hard to treat. So that too, if that infection becomes overwhelming, can lead also to an amputation of a lower extremity or as quite commonly people might associate with, you know, issues with their toes and the lower feet. Now, luckily, that is really, really rare. We're not seeing it nowadays. Uh, it's still around, but we're not seeing it because of good quality type 2 and type 1 diabetic management. And have you seen a rise in type 2 diabetes over the course of, the, say, the last 10, 20 years in line with the rise in having overweight and having obesity? Is there a direct correlation between the two? We are seeing an increasing incidence, certainly through the Western world. And we're certainly aware when we looked at the 2022 you know, statistics that there has been a, an incremental increase. What we are now seeing, though, luckily, is better management. And that management is because of that shared care understanding and the advance of chronic disease management programs at a primary care level that's within general practice. So I think that's really going to be our game changer moving forward is that people are coming to us in general practice and they're looking for good quality management and asking, you know, understandably so, uh, really good high quality questions to say, well, how can I get this better? How can I, you know, work with this to use as little medicines as possible? Do I need to go on? Uh, do I need injectables? You know, and being able to ask all those questions and for us to say, this is where we are. This is what's going to move forward. This is what we can do with you. I think that's, you know, a really healthy way to look at chronic disease management. And of course, in terms of the management, insulin is something people will be well aware of. Chat us through mm. how that's used for people who have type 1 or type 2. Well, again, you know, type 1 is a very different uh, issue. The mainstay of type 1 diabetes will be insulin-based management. Certainly in our younger children nowadays, it tends to be a pump, uh, as in because we do know that children over the years found it quite difficult, together with parents, you know, injecting on a daily basis. So there's a what we call a pump implanted just, you know, under the skin surface. Really fascinating stuff. The use of technology in medicine is, you know, it's been amazing in that there's Bluetooth control, the sugar levels are picked up, and then the pump releases the appropriate amount of insulin. I mean, how, how amazing is that? Cool. You know? yeah. It's really cool. And, you know, and that minimizes the distress to our younger patient cohort and also our adolescent cohort who are out and about and can be really busy as well. Uh, in type 2 diabetes, we certainly would like, you know, not to move into the insulin category, but sometimes it may be required. Uh, and if it is required, it's not a failure of management. It's not a failure or advancing disease. It's again, uh, there is no fault on the patient it may just be necessary. And the reason it may be necessary is to prevent this damage to large and small blood vessels. And that's the reason we're considering it. So if your doctor does say, OK, the tablets haven't worked for you, we may be looking at insulin. It's not to get disheartened. It certainly is a case that at this point, using insulin is necessary and it's subcutaneous. So you're not injecting into the muscle, you're injecting into a pinchable part of the lower abdomen or the upper thigh. I think we've covered a huge amount of ground and the key thing to summarize it all is that if you have a concern, go and talk to your GP, that's important. We've looked at all the range of symptoms. It's very broad, it's very wide. Go and chat to your GP. And you know, one of the, the great things, and that's why I like working with you is the fact that lifestyle comes up time and time again, eating better, you know, cooking more, less salt, less added sugars in your food, moving that little bit more. All the lifestyle factors will really help, but well, point of contact, yeah. go to your GP, talk to the GP, and then you can take it from there with your GP in terms of medication oh, and or lifestyle factors. You know, and you know, we've got great websites like Diabetes Island are phenomenal. They really are up to date and they give some really comprehensive, you know, bite sized information. And again, you know, on Diabetes Island, it will say at least up to 40 percent of the diagnosis can be prevented with a healthy diet and looking out, you know, at weight management uh, and looking at that, you know, a further 40 percent may delay the onset of the condition. You know, just by making these tweaks, moving more, eating well and being aware of other lifestyle factors that come into play. The obvious ones being salt, smoking and alcohol. So people who want more information, Diabetes Ireland is a great resource. And what's your own Instagram handle if people want to follow you on Instagram? My Instagram handle is at Dr. Sumi Dunn.
Fantastic. I'm sure we'll get you lots of followers after listening to today's ep. Sumi, it's been great to catch up, and I'll catch up with you in person very, very soon. Folks, I really hope you enjoyed today's episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry. You know where we are, Real Health at independent.ie, at Carl Henry PT on Instagram. And we'll see you next week for more Real Health. Slow and go full. Bye.